So you've decided that you want to become a planner or a strategist in an agency. And you're probably thinking to yourself, shit, what now? Except this time I'm chatting to Paul Warwick. He was a very senior planner with 25 years experience and has worked at places such as Saatchi & Saatchi and DDB in both London and Australia. And he has a wealth of knowledge that I think you guys will find super useful as you're looking to not only break into advertising, but specifically strategy. So if you find this video useful, please hit like and subscribe and um, yeah, enjoy the video. Paul, welcome to Shit One Now. Thank you so much for jumping on today. No worries, Chris. Good to speak to you. Please tell us a bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, so I have been working in the industry for a little bit less than 25 years now. I've basically been a planner since I started out. I was lucky enough to do a stint in Sydney about 15, 16 years ago now. Uh, worked at DDB there and also a place called Bellamy Hayden, uh, which was my... That was my first taste of consultancy rather than pure agency. Uh, and it was a fantastic place to be. And genuinely, I don't think I've worked in a building since that had such a concentration of talent, even though it was there were only 25, 30 of us. Right. Uh, but there were some really impressive people who've done, you know, gone on to do some great things in Australia, in the UK, um, and in, uh, in the US as well. Um, and that kind of gave me a flavor for a slightly different approach to things so having come back here and spent a decade or so uh, back in agency world uh, I now run my own kind of consultancy kind of strategic hub um, and I guess we'll probably get on to talk about it but I think one of the dangers of consultancy is if you're not delivering it's a lot harder to uh, add the same level of value so I offer strategic uh, advice but I also then use that to build out virtual teams of delivery experts using the network that I've got, um, which means we can kind of structure agency teams around what the client needs, mm. uh, which for me as a strategist is great because it means you're not, you're not biased towards any particular solution. You, know, you can do what's right and then get the right people in to do it, um, which at the moment, touch word is proving to be a reasonably, uh, reasonably uh, uh, welcome offer. And I think we could definitely go down this war, uh, rabbit's warren of a discussion for a while and nerd out about this sort of stuff. But <laughs> just to just to take a step back and look at the other end of the telescope, um, obviously you've had a, as you mentioned, illustrious career in strategy, both <laughs> a in... long career. <laughs> I don't know about illustrious. <laughs> but, well, you know, you, you do I've look had quite... some fun along the way. <laughs> well, you do look quite youthful, and I have seen things on Facebook about you taking up rugby again. So uh, you know. <laughs> Somewhat. Yeah, I think go down very well with the family. <laughs> um, so winding the clock back to when you were first sort of looking at getting into the advertising, like what's your story? Like how did you how did you break in and what were you doing? Yeah, so this is probably going to be quite an annoying story because I, I remember when I was first starting out, my first two bosses, one of them was kind of a failed musician and then fell into advertising. Right. And the other were she started out in the civil service and got bored and fell into advertising. And I remember at the time thinking, I'm, I'm really cross about that because I worked damn hard to get into advertising. And I knew it was what I wanted to do. And it wasn't easy to get here. And I was always frustrated. But, but it seemed a generation ago they just could stumble into it. Um, and yet I look at it now and it's so much harder than it ever was when I was getting into the business. It really is. Um, and I, you know, I, 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 it's so what I'm going to say now will probably be just as annoying to anybody listening. Um, but to put it in context, I interviewed for my first job three days after Google Incorporated. So it really was a different world. It genuinely mm. was a different world. Yeah. You know, my first agency, we had one computer that had an uh, internet connection. It was dial up and the FD literally kind of stood behind you while you were on it to uh, <laughs> to limit the amount of time you had because you could kind of see the meter running in his eyes. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> all, all I did, so um, I, I did a kind of ludicrous degree. Uh, I did it because I thought it would be fun uh, and it was fun. I never imagined it would be useful. I did philosophy and psychology, yeah, right. uh, which actually is the perfect planner's degree because half of it is how do you put together, articulate, structure, critique and argument. And the other half is how do you understand the way people behave? 
Yeah. Um, so it, it ended up being the perfect thing for me, but I, I purely did it because I was interested in it and enjoyed it. Um, and I do think there's an element to that. I, when I, I remember coming to Australia and a lot more people were doing functional degrees, doing marketing degrees, doing advertising degrees than I'd been familiar with. Um, and in some ways, I think that's a bit of a shame because, you know, when you've been in your career, even five years, most of what you learn at uni is out of date. Yeah. It's not about what you learn, but it's about encouraging the way you think. It's about encouraging an inquisitiveness and a curiosity. Um, and I was always far more interested in people who had just done fun stuff and clearly loved what they were doing because they can learn the rest. If they think yeah. in an interesting way, you can, you can learn how to fill in a, you know, four P's template or a brand pyramid, all of that stuff. You know, facts, stuff, information, that's easy. But it's what, how does this person think that's kind of, kind of interesting? Um, and I, so I did a kind of ludicrous degree that, that didn't really have any obvious um, application to it. And I remember sitting in the uni common room a couple of days. It was between, I'd done my last exam and I was waiting, waiting to get my degree result. And um, one of the Saatchi's uh, ads for the British Army came on the screen. About a dozen of us watching. Um, and the, the whole premise was it was shot first person. So you were a soldier and uh, you were one of four people carrying a stretcher and you came up to a ravine. There was supposed to be a rope bridge. The rope bridge was down and a super came up and said, uh, if you're thinking, how will I get across? Then thanks goodbye. If you're thinking, how will we get across? Here's the number to call. Half the people in the room went, that's ridiculous. That's just stupid. I mean, really, how can they think that's a good idea? And the other half of the people in the room were like, no, 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 it's great because, th because this, this is, this is what, you know, you have to think like that. And I remember looking at the two groups of people and I thought the people who loved that ad, it wouldn't have been a waste of time for them applying to the army. They might not have all got in, but it wouldn't have been a waste of time. The people who hated that ad, were never ever going to be sold yeah. and someone had done that someone had done that deliberately and it was amazing um and uh just by chance a couple of days later i was in the careers office uh, you know a as you do um and so I, I got to the advertising folder and there was a uh, a sheet in there from the um the ipa which is the equivalent of the afa and uh uh, I, the, the sheet was what is account planning <laughs> and I just read these two sides of A4 and it's like yeah that's cool you know yeah. and I think um, the one thing that I, I would say and the one thing I do think translates uh, now is um, from that moment I had quite a clear idea of what it was that I wanted to do within advertising mm. um, I I really enjoyed understanding how people worked. I enjoy. I wanted to be the person who did that. Mm. Person. Well, how does how do people have to think when they see this thing, when they respond to this thing? How do we go about influencing them? How do we change a decision? What's the bit that unlocks everything here? And it was that type of problem solving I wanted to do. So I I always wanted to be a planner. I didn't want to get into advertising. It wasn't about you know. Yes, you what I, I was excited by ads. I think they're fascinating parts of culture but it wasn't about you know um a, a, a particular I, I could have done that role in a number of different agencies i could have done that role in a number of different types of businesses yeah it, in some ways it didn't have to be advertising and certainly today it wouldn't have to be advertising but what i did have was clarity around the type of thing i wanted to spend my time doing and i think that's probably a more important decision now for someone, you know, starting out, you know, not do I want to get into advertising? Because frankly, what is advertising? Exactly. You'll tie yourself in knots if that's your ambition. But your ambition should be, well, what are the kind of things that I want to be involved in building and making? What do I want my role in the process to be? What do I want my day to day to be? Yeah, I love the fact that some days I'll be sat at my desk and I'll be, I'll be wrestling with commercial problems. You know, business model structure, what products, what services, what offer, what pricing. And then on another day, I'll be looking at, you know, how do we get this particular group of people 
to suddenly and very passionately feel that brand A should be switched to from brand B or brand A is worth 50% more than brand B. And I think in a way you're very lucky to have kind of had that moment of realization to go, yeah, this is, this is totally what I want to do. I should be clear at the time. I didn't realize it was a moment of realization. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, These things are a lot tidier with hindsight, but yeah, I I was, I was serendipity, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Cause I mean, for me personally, I was, I, I mean, that's the whole reason I started this channel is because the moment that I realized I wanted to get into advertising, I said to myself, like, shit, like what, like what now? It seems like this massive gilded cage with so many different things that you can do. And I guess the mission of this is to really sort of unpack that and talk to different people within it to understand all the different roles. So it's great that you've gone into so much detail about, um, you know, about specifically what you do and then how that's taken your taking your journey on it's 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 really interesting what i I do think it's worth thinking about and i think look look, if i was starting out now with those interests i could be a planner i could be a ux designer you know i I think it'd be fascinating to have that level of technical expertise to just hack decision processes or hack consumer journeys um and spend your time you know building digital platforms around some of those human principles there are a number of things that my fascination could take me into today. Back back 25 years ago, it was pretty much ad, ad agencies. Yeah. Um, you know, or there were there were different formats, but they tended to be comms formats. They tended to be quite broadcast. They weren't as interactive. They weren't as rich yeah. as they are now. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's an important thing to think about is, well, what, what do I want to spend my time doing? What excites me? Um, cause it's tough industry. It's not as lucrative an industry as it used to be. If you're not having a good time, then, <laughs> you know, you, th- there's a lot of arguments to say you'd be better served doing something else. <laughs> there are a lot of ways to have a very good time in this industry. And certainly I, I wouldn't change it. You know, I, mm. I would be, I, I think Beth talked about variety in, in her day. And I'd certainly, you know, I can't imagine, uh, yeah, I, I've toyed with the idea of going client side. It's not something I've ever done. I've ever played around with for more than a couple of minutes because I just think I'd get bored. Yeah. Uh, I also think I'd struggle in a professional environment in a way that agencies <laughs> are not professional businesses. Yeah. They're great businesses, but they're massively informal and they're just mm. utterly chaotic sometimes. Yeah. And that's wonderful. Um, so, you know, I think there's, there's elements there of just kind of understanding yourself and what's going to, what's going to make you happy, what's going to keep you engaged. Cause you know, this is hopefully a path you're going to go down for a long time. Yeah. Notwithstanding the fact that everyone's going to have to make pivots this way and that. So, um, yeah, look, that'd be the first, so that, that is kind of my, my first piece of advice is just really don't necessarily think about where you want to be think about what you want to do it's a really interesting point Mm. you made there in terms of it's not where you want to go it's what you want to do obviously for you that's kind of brought you between both agencies and consultancies as well a lot of a lot of the entry-level strategists we talk to um or people in you know coming towards the end of their master's degree or their degree are looking to go into advertising and specifically strategy are also getting hit up by consultancies such as kpmg who are also trying to, and Accenture, who are trying to take that piece of the pie. For you, yeah. really, like what's in, in um, layman's terms or Paul Warwick terms, what's, you know, how would you define one or the other? And what would you say the key differences are between them? Uh, well, the, okay, so I think there's a number of distinctions there that, that it would help to pull apart. God, that's such a planner answer. Um, <laughs> yeah, do you want to get the white, do you want to get the whiteboard out? <laughs> so, so firstly, let's, let's be clear. Um, I could never have had a career in KPMG or McKinsey or those kinds of guys. They'd have sacked me after six months because I'd have been frustrated by the structure. You know, those are companies that have come. They're, they're basically they are legal and accounting companies have expanded that approach into other fields. Now, culturally, that would not have been a place I'd have done very well. Yeah. Uh, the consultancies I've worked at have been and and you know and as i said kind of probably the best of them was bellamy hayden but 
I what I was doing was never any different. Whether I did it at DDB, whether I did it at Searches, whether I did it at Bellamy, it was still the same stuff I was doing. Uh, the thing I loved at Bellamy Hayden, and the thing that and the thing that really got me into the thing that really interested me in the consultancy model was you're always aware in an agency as a planner that you're kind of you're the you're a means to an end. You know, you're always hopefully the means to getting to good, effective, you know, the best creative work that you can. Yeah. But it's about the creative work. Of course, mm -hmm. it's about the creative work. That's what the clients are buying. Um, when you work in a consultancy, generally, you've only been brought into the room because the traditional approach hasn't worked. You know, clients will try an agency. They'd only bring in an extra cost if there's a reason to bring in that extra cost. So I kind of found it hugely liberating to walk into a room. And the premise as I walked into that room was you're here because the traditional approach hasn't worked. You go, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, know, you are already open minded and you've already put cash on the table against us trying to find an unusual solution. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, then I, I loved the fact that that solution could be anything. You know, I didn't have a TV department to feed. I didn't have 50 app developers sat in the next, you know, in, in, in the next um, floor of the office. Um, you could say exactly, well, OK, well, given your challenge, this is the right answer. Um, and that's huge, hugely liberating. So those two things really allow you as a strategist to really push for the best solution you can get to. The challenge is you don't do it. Consultancies yeah. don't deliver anything. And that's a really that's a really big problem. Firstly, because it's actually quite unfulfilling. You know, if you come up with what you think is a good solution, but you're never involved in executing it, you know, even the ones that get executed, you're coming away going, well, I would have liked to have seen it done slightly differently than that. Yeah. Um, but a lot of them simply don't get executed because they then get passed on to people who, for one reason or another, want to stamp their own mark on things. And it all gets, you know, it kind of all moves on to a slightly different place. Um, and I think one of the things I was very aware of when I set up on my own was if I wasn't surrounded by really good people who I knew I could work with and who I knew I could deliver on the things that I was selling clients, um, a business strategy that was predicated on me basically selling PowerPoint right. was going to be quite term limited. <laughs> um, so th th there, there are good things about consultancies. There are challenging things about consultancies. Um, personally, I think I, I would always want to be involved in, in the delivery, in actually building, making, bringing things to life. Um, you know, I was I was brought up on the effectiveness culture at DDB. I was brought, you know, I, I wrote, particularly in the first half of my career, I wrote a lot of IPA and AFA papers, a lot of effectiveness papers. Um, and I've always had that kind of, again, it kind of goes back to the, the competitive sportsmen. It's that slight scorekeeping thing. Yeah. I've really enjoyed that process of working out, well, did we win? Did we yeah. do better than the competitor in the sector? Yeah. Um, and and you don't get to that if you're not involved in the execution. Yeah. So, again, it kind of goes back to, well, what do you want to do? If you are a pure play problem solver, if you're quite an academic person, if you just enjoy the intellectual challenge, then consultancies are going to be great for you. And if you are somebody who likes the security of having a process and applying a process, you know, perhaps you're quite a mathematical brain. You recognize the starting conditions, you apply the process, you get the answer then the McKinsey style of consultancy is going to be great for you. If you're somebody who wants to build, make things, see it come to life, have that, you know, role in the creative expert, then agency world is probably going to be better. Um, but even then within that, it's a case of, well, but what agency? <laughs> what yeah. do, I, do I want to be involved in building and making 30 second AV units? Hmm. Do I want to be involved in building and making apps? you know actual i say physical mm. things they feel like physical things they're not physical <laughs> but you know yeah but, but you know things that genuinely provide um a service and meet a need you know that it, it there are there are there are different ways of looking at it i 
I never worried about whether I was in an agency or in a consultancy, possibly until it was a little bit too late. Uh, and this was one of my first kind of, you know, you, you, the, the whole shit what now moments thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one of the most significant I had in my career was actually after I came back from Australia to the UK. And I got this idea in my head that I just didn't want to work in traditional agencies because I had such a good time in, in Australia. And even the traditional agencies in Australia aren't that traditional yeah. because the nature of the market is actually, as you say, it's, it's actually very progressive. And um, the nature of um, the way the population is concentrated around. So you, know, you, you can try a lot of things. And certainly around the time I was there, the likes of Naked and what have you were doing some really interesting things. And I came back, I was like, I never want to work for a Sarchis. I never want to work for a JWT, for a whatever. Um, and, uh, and actually, that was the wrong thing to think, you know, because I ended up working um, for, a, for a few years, working in a range of kind of, you know, uh, contract roles and what have you in, in you know, integrated agencies. And I soon found out that integrated didn't mean integrated. It just meant siloed into a channel that's not advertising. <laughs> <laughs> um, you work in, you know, worked with with digital agencies, work with experience, yeah, I, and I I worked in quite a lot of different places, um, and didn't really find what I was looking for because what I was trying to replicate was an ability to have the same type of influence on the process uh, that I'd had at DDB, that I'd had at um, at Bellamy Hayden. Um, and it was only when I got to Saatchi's, in the end, it was a traditional agency that got me out of that. But not because I joined a traditional agency, it was because I joined the Toyota account. And I always, in my head, joined Toyota rather than joining Saatchi's. Um, and the reason for that is that I, 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 I love the car industry as a sector. I think it's a great sector. Mm. Um, I find cars interesting as a product. Mm. Uh, but more than that, I think... Cars have a more intricate consumer journey, a more intricate path to purchase than almost any sector that I've worked in. Um, and, uh, and yet they also, and you, you, know, you know this, if you work on the likes of Toyota going head to head with the likes of VW and Audi and BMW, they're also hugely brand sensitive mm. as a sector. So you've got that balance of, the brands, the creativity and the equity of a brand really matters. And yet also you get to be really granular and kind of roll your sleeves up and get stuck into some very detailed um, you know, cross channel um, planning. And I loved that. Um, I loved that kind of dichotomy and bringing that together. I love the variety that that brought, but it also meant that if you're a strategist leading one of those accounts, you genuinely have got the full suite of tools to use and you have to use them. So mm. it's not only kind of the, the more qualitative, creative aspects of managing a brand, it's also some of the more, more kind of uh, prosaic, more down to earth elements of, well, commercially, this stuff's all got to work underneath it. And you're, you're kind of, you know, doing the Tetris on those pieces to make everything fit. Totally. Um, so again, it was the, and, and that, that was a role that I then was in for five years because I was doing the things I wanted to do and that I was good at. So again, it kind of, it wasn't about where I was. It was about doing the right stuff. It's funny you say that because Talking to, talking to quite a lot of people who've worked on cars before, I personally think it's a great place to learn. You, you genuinely are going to learn so much. There is so nothing much. you won't cover. Yeah, because you know, you'll be doing things from, obviously, big above-the-line campaigns. You'll be doing a lot of them because there's always cars coming out, new face yeah. models coming out. But then on the flip side, back on the more, let's call it, cx route of things, you'll be looking at things like um, EDM strategies for tracking purchase cars you'll be looking at in dealership experiences. Um, when we were here, a uh, junior planner and I would go to different dealerships and mark each <laughs> other to find, to find insights. We probably thought we were a bit weird, like two young guys looking to go buy a Toyota Hilux, but yeah. <laughs> never, never be able to afford it in a million years. But it's interesting to, 
it's kind of that whether you are a strategist or a or a pseudo what have you i would just my advice to sort of you know junior people looking to break into the industry as a whole try and get yourself into a car account as soon as you can you look at i think tesla is an example of what the potential of the car industry is because um he doesn't and if you've not read his two manifestos you should they're available online they're about 250 words each and they are brilliant um but they make it clear that tesla is effectively self-funding r&d for uh, an electrification project he wants to solve the world's energy problem and the only way to be able to afford the um uh, the research that's necessary to do that is to use cars as a kind of trojan horse to, right. uh, to, to get itself funded. So the battery technology, the, the energy storage, the energy capture, those types of things. You know, there's a reason, there's a reason that he's also patented house tiles. Um, <laughs> cars is not the end game. Tesla is the means to an end there. And that, mm. that's, yeah, it's fascinating. But I, I you know, I, again, I, I think, so that, that was one of my first kind of what next moments. Cause I did, you know, you, you had a really good four years in Oz and I came back and you are a bit like, well, my, my network's kind of, you know, I'm a little bit out of touch. I don't know which of the cool agencies these days. I don't know quite who's doing what to the same extent. Um, and uh, and it took me a little bit of time to work through that. But the, the thing that kind of solved the problem was it wasn't about the agency I was in. It was about the things the account had me doing. Yeah. And then that kind of... Uh, uh, that kind of built from there. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I think the um, we've obviously covered quite a lot of hot tips and uh, some awesome nuggets of uh, advice there, Paul. Thank you so much. But I guess as we're coming towards the end of this interview, do you have any sort of quick fire hot tips that you'd recommend for young strategists looking to break into the industry? Um, yeah, so I think there's a, there's a couple of things. And look, some of them have been touched on in, in the... Uh, in, in the, the, the conversation you had with Beth, the conversation you had with Ben. But I think, I think one of the things that's probably a bit of a theme coming through from what I've been saying so far is um, just know what success looks like for you. And again, this is a really planner thing, but you know, be really brutally clear about what the objectives are. Whenever a client comes to you with a problem and says, well, this is this, that's not the real problem. There's always something that underpins it. Mm. There's always a kind of a deeper object. And yet understand that about yourself. It's like, well, what do I really want to be doing? Why do I want to get into this? You know, do I want to get into this because of the output? Do I want to get into it because of the process, the day to day? What's the bit that's going to stimulate me the most? You know, uh, people's passion for the industry is something, again, that's come through in the conversations that you've had. But I would say, well, what, what is it that kindles that passion? Mm. You know, is it simply a love of? 30 second pieces of film is it a love of the inventiveness you know is it part of the process is it the culture of the agencies you know what what's the bit so so that that hopefully gives you a clear idea if you've got a clear idea of what success looks like you've got better ways in which to target it because yeah. firstly it'll give you a clear idea of the types of organization be they agencies be they consultancies be they clients these days, a lot of people, a lot of clients are in housing, you know. Yeah. Um, and some of them are coming up with some quite interesting results. Um, you know, that will give you kind of a, a sense of the types of organisations you want to target, but also the types of role you want to target. You know, you can see, you could be in the best agency in the world, but if you're in the wrong role, you know, if you're a kind of a closet planner but who's in an account management role. Yeah. Or if you're a, you know, if you're a closet creative who's in a planning role or vice versa, you know, yeah. that's still, you know, it could be, could be the best agency in town, but it's not going to make you happy and you're not going to do your best work. No. Um, so I think that that would be the first thing is really know what success looks like. Um, and then look, network has been mentioned before um, in terms of how to get in. And I, I, I'm a firm believer that, like, you know, Grad schemes and what have you, you know, those, those formal channels, they're fine. Um, but I, I'm not a big believer that they're the best way to get in. I think, you know, the, the numbers game just naturally means that some very, very good people are going to be overlooked. You know, I remember I only ever saw the very final shortlist of candidates um, on the DDB grad scheme. 
But even then, that was about 30, 40 people we'd have in for that one day session. Mm. And we knew that six of them were going to get a gig and five of them were going to go into various forms of account management. And one of them was going to go into planning. (laughs) Just those odds are not great. Um, And also the things that make you stand out in an environment like that aren't necessarily the things that make you good. Mm. You know, extroverts do really well in that environment. But I actually, I think introverts make brilliant planners because their natural introspectiveness <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. when directed and focused on a problem can be a huge, huge asset. So use using your network is a great way to go. I look, yeah, my, my first job, I literally, I went onto the IPA website. I uh, sent a letter. <laughs> <laughs> Actual letter. It's all right. Direct, direct um, marketing. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> to, to, to every agency uh, in Manchester and in London. You yeah. Know? Um, and uh, and I got a, you know, I, I sent the letter off uh, literally the next morning. I got a phone call from uh, Dave Bell, who owns Cheat and Bell. Uh, he had me in the agency that, that afternoon and I started on the Tuesday. Brilliant. That kind of thing doesn't happen. But, but it was serendipity. Um, I had sent him a letter saying I wanted to be a planner the same week he had hired the former head of strategy from Ogilvy and Mather, who was moving up to Manchester from London, uh, and she needed someone to be her bitch. I own you. You're my bitch. Um, (laughs) She was used to a department of 30. So so it was like, like, yes, please. I'm suddenly getting a one-to-one masterclass with somebody who has incredible calibre in major agencies and I'm doing it in a small place with 25 people uh, where at six months in, I'm nominally the lead planner on, you know, one, one of the accounts, you know, but I got lucky with that, but it can be engineered. You know, I think particularly, particularly with Australia being so focused around, you know, a, a small number of urban centers, um, you know, there are great agencies um, in, well, I'm, I'm familiar with Sydney, I'm familiar with Melbourne, I'm familiar with Perth, less familiar with Brisbane, if I'm honest, um, uh, and Adelaide. Um, but, you know, there are great agencies in all of those cities, and it's not hard to work out who they are, and it's not hard to find out who the key people are. And there's a very good chance that most people will know someone by no more than one degree of separation. You know, and I thought Ben's approach to working his network, but also just getting conversations with interesting people um, yeah. and growing his network is absolutely the right way to go. You know, yeah. and, um, uh, and and I, I remember both at DDB and at Bellamy Hayden, you'd get proactive contacts from people who clearly knew something about the agency, knew something about the work we'd done. So you had a sense as to why they were reaching out, why they were getting in touch. And you'd give them a chat. I mean, like I, I always I always felt a little bit of a burden in Oz because I felt guilty that um, purely by the, 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 it, it, I was able to sell the fact that I was English to kind of com- convince people that I might know something. Fellas hate me, eh? Not a bit of it. I'm your bloody hero, eh, old scat? Jesus. <laughs> Whereas, you know, <laughs> don't, t- don't tell them, actually, Paul. Fuck, like, it's, actually, it's a very different, very different. Like, just because I've done at that time, I'd done kind of seven years in London, didn't mean that I had anything that any other plan did. But I always, I always felt that it, it, there was an onus to, you know, I got involved with the APG, I got involved with training, I wanted to try and help out young Aussie planners as much as possible. Because I, I remember looking around, and a lot of the, a lot of the senior planners were English, and I didn't think that was right. Mm. you know so i wanted to try and help so i I would always try and have a coffee with people i'd always try and have a cup of tea with people um you know i remember i I remember pitching oh god i remember pitching holden utes uh well pitching holden and utes utes was the pitch question they'd given us and we had to talk about the cultural importance of utes in australia first three people who stood up in our presentation were poms (laughs) <laughs> you know it was just with hindsight it was just ludicrous yeah um and it, it was right so yeah you know, i always felt I, I wanted to do 
uh, uh, you know as much as I can. And I, I think I do think Australia, and I do think I think it's a great market. I think it's a really pro, really positive market. You know, the fact that it's quite small means that you know you're going to work with everybody two or three times in your career in mm. some capacity, and you can't piss people off. And you do wish everybody well because sometimes you're up against them, but give it 12 months, you've both moved jobs and you're actually on the same side of the table. And, you know, I think everybody, you know, I, I, I did get the sense that the, the networks there are really strong. Mm. Um, and I think that um, you know, it just does just take a little bit of effort, but probably not so much as you think to, to get in and get that contact. Um, and, uh, and as I think Beth said, you know, people like talking about themselves, they like talking about their work. So if you've approached someone because you're excited, you know, a, excited about the solution they found to a problem or excited about the work they made or what have you um i think that's great i think um there's two two things that i think are really interesting that help well help candidates catch my eye um the first is there's no such thing as a junior planner it doesn't matter how much same thing the same as there's no such thing as a junior creative it doesn't matter whether you've got 20 years experience or 20 minutes experience. If you come up with the right answer, if you come up with the right idea, it doesn't matter how senior you are. I love that. You know? that's great. And, and I think that's one of the great things about the industry. But but actually for planners, that's a challenge because it doesn't matter if you're 45 or 25, you are going to be stood in a room in front of the CEO at some point and you've got to say something credible and he's got to listen to you and have it and, and, you know, and take influence. And there's a number of different ways of doing that. You know, some people do it because they've done their homework to the nth degree and they know everything and they know that some people do it through their character and their charisma. Um, and some people do it because, you know, maybe the target market is quite a, quite a youth orientated market and they can convince this guy that actually they are closer to it than he is. But, mm. you know, I think, you can tell people who are going to have that degree of influence and you can tell people who can make that mark. Um, and you are looking for someone who can give you something you don't currently have. You know, it's like if I can have a conversation with someone and maybe they don't have the experience to come up with fully formed strategies themselves yet. Um, but if that conversation between us sparks something in me that I wouldn't have thought of otherwise, then it's like, well, this person's going to make me better and I can train them to harness the things they've just said and recognize them and develop them into the, their own fully fledged strategies. Then that's, you know, that those are two things that are really powerful because you're, you're, you're adding something yourself, but you're also contributing to the whole and taking it to a place it otherwise wouldn't have gone. Um, those are the things that I look for because, you know, as, as I said at the beginning, you can learn stuff. That's yeah. fine, but you know, it's it's what's that spark? What's that? So you know, if you can, if you can have a conversation which helps the person on the other side of the table get a sense of, you can solve problems. Potentially, you can solve a problem for them, but you can do it in a way that adds value. Then I think you're having a very good conversation. To see how you can take it on. Definitely. Um, and the other thing, and it, it kind of touches on what Ben did with his Happy Meal and what have you, is uh, um, walk the talk. I think this is mm. particularly true of creative people. But you know, I, I had a conversation with somebody who wanted to be a content strategist a couple of months ago. And so, well, this is great. Why are you sending me a CV? If you create content, then create some content. Show me what you got. I want to see what you got. Give me 30 seconds of something to watch that, that tells me who you are rather yeah. than forcing me to read three sides of prose. You know, um, actually walk that talk. If you're telling me you can do social media strategy, why am I hearing about you through an email instead of hearing about you via social media? Exactly right. You know? and <laughs> Yeah, because it's um, it goes back to the thing that I covered with with Ben and, and with Beth as well is in this industry, you know, it, you have to treat yourself almost like a brand. And, you know, if if you're saying you deliver X, then deliver X. <laughs> so exactly to your point, if you're a content strategist, yeah. I want to see 
something that validates that. If you're a CX strategist, show me something that validates that in a you know cool and engaging way. At the end of the day, like you know, I, I really think that CV is more of a hygiene thing that kind of gets sent as a. If you want more info, check it out. But this is what I've come to offer you because this is what I think I'm, I can really add value for you. I'll, I'll be hand, hands up. It's not an easy thing. No. The bit I find hardest about running uh, running a consultancy is new business and it is business development and it is that kind of self-promotion aspect of it. Um, I'm far more comfortable promoting other people and building other people's brands and thinking about them than I am thinking about myself, um, which partly is kind of, you know, goes back to being an introvert but but i have you but you you have to do it you learn to do it and you know i set time aside to plan nice thinking just the same as i set time aside to plan whatever projects i'm working on that week yeah um and it's difficult but it but it's important and it does it is the best way to demonstrate what you can do is to to do what you can what you say you can do yeah um so yeah, those those were kind of the the hot tips. I think you know know, know what success looks like. W- work your network, um, not least because the humans in the industry are the most fun part about the industry. So spend time with them. Uh, solve a problem, but solve it in a way that shows you can add add value um, or create value rather, because it doesn't have to come from you. It can be what you inspire. And, or spark off in people around you, um, and and you know, walk the talk. Yeah. If you're if you say you are good at particular things, then demonstrate those things rather than just writing on a CV that you are good at those things. Yeah, yeah, and d- don't say things like I'm good at Excel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Being I mean, good at Excel is much underrated skill. I have to. I'm I'm <laughs> awful at it. My wife is amazing, um, and given that uh, it's it's quite often a requirement to do some relatively tricky effectiveness analysis and look at, you know, commercial data and what have you. Um, do you know what? <laughs> Having somebody who can translate that and format that into something that I can actually get inspiration from. Um, I, you know, I'm, it's an uh, art. It, it, it's uh, yeah. there, there is, there is an art to data sometimes. Mm. You know, and I think there is definitely an art to selling the insights from data. Um, and look, we could uh, I, I could talk about I could talk about data insights and how to generate data insights till till the cows come home. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, you know, even those unsexy things actually done in the right way, done in a way that add value um, can be hugely, hugely powerful. Um, yeah. And and they needn't fight. You know, I think one of the one of the one of the real shames about our industry these days is that in order to stand out and in order to clarify our propositions, we draw false dichotomies. You know, I'm a creative strategist. I'm a commercial strategist. I'm an advertising person. I'm a digital person. I'm a, actually this stuff works together. Yeah. You know, good creative should be more commercially successful than any other type of work. That's why we you know, that's what we're using the creativity for. <laughs> Yeah. Equally, if you want something to be more commercially effective, being bland and rational and going against all the things that we know about how people make decisions ain't going to cut it. Exactly. Yeah, and I, th- <laughs> I, th- I think those false dichotomies are really, you can understand why people do it. It's because you need seven points. The receiving end can't take in more than one message. But actually, the truth is these things are blended. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it actually, one of the, one of the, things that was easier about starting out 25 years ago when most things were under lead agencies which called themselves ad agencies was you didn't have to draw this distinction between a, i'm a that type of strategist i'm a this type of creative it was just we got a human problem here we're trying to solve it yeah and the fundamental of the business is still um you know people are not evolving quickly and the fundamental unit of all marketing is that we are trying to influence people to think things and to behave in certain ways that they otherwise naturally wouldn't do now that that is a fundamental that changes very slowly the toolkit we've got at our disposal is changing incredibly rapidly and is a lot richer and a lot more powerful and a lot more effective than it ever has been 
But the thing that we are trying to change, you know, people's minds, they they evolve slowly and, um, you know, they, they should always be at the heart of how we think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the best planners and strategists these days um, think agnostically in terms of how that is delivered, how the goal of what we want the consumer to do is, you know, is done. I'm not, I'm not arguing that expertise isn't important because it absolutely is. Mm. But if that expertise isn't being orchestrated together, um, either by someone agency side or someone client side, then it's not going to work coherently and um, in an accumulative way to get the effect that you want. Totally. Um, and certainly from my point of view, it's that, it's that overarching piece that I love trying to, trying to bring together, trying to organise, you know, the classic what's our organising thought. Yeah. And build around that. And, you know, they, those are the things that still, still excite me and I think are still valid in the industry. Yeah. Um, even though you then have to go an awful lot deeper down into some of the areas of expertise to actually, you know, deliver using, using the suite of tools that we've got to use. So Paul has been coming towards the end of this conversation now. It's been incredibly insightful as it should be coming from a planner. Any parting thoughts before we wrap up? Um, no, not really. I mean, I think the only thing that I, I would like to add is just that reminder that, um, you know, I, I started almost in a pre-Google world. So there is a very, very good chance that everything I've just said is utterly irrelevant to the lives of everybody who's watching. Don't bullshit me. Bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. Bullshit. Um, and they should feel free to absolutely ignore it. You know, I think one of the great <laughs> things about our business is that, yeah, experience is great, but actually talent is more important. So if you've got the right answer and the right answer for you, screw what the grey hairs think. Just, yeah. just do your own thing and um, good luck would be my, my, uh, my party thought. <laughs> well, Paul, it's thank you so much for coming on and um, I'll let you crack on with the rest of your day. Thank you. Good to speak to you, Chris. Cheers, mate.